Can everyone hear me? No. Great, thank you. Welcome all. Welcome to our panel this afternoon after lunch. I'm uh, glad to be here today with uh, CEOs respectively, Mike of Citigroup, Andy from US Bank, Margaret from Synchrony, Kurt from Comerica, and John from Regions. Thanks for, thanks for coming and being here today. We thought we'd uh, talk today about uh, business of banking, as they said, and we'll, we're going to start out on a topic that uh, we all see in the dynamic marketplace around uh, the evolving nature of consumers' customer behavior. Mike, maybe we'll start with you just in terms of what you're seeing across consumers, commercial clients, investors, and, and you also have a unique view to see this both within the U.S. and internationally. Yeah, we're, we were actually just comparing notes a little bit. You know, this is the, the interesting time of year where we've got to sit down and create those things called budgets and figure out what the heck it is we're going to be planning for. Uh, I would say, you know, the, part of the, the good news of the story is that the continued strength and resiliency of not just the U.S., but the global, global consumer continues. Uh, I think on, the, on the, the strength, again, not just in the U.S., but around the world of um, some fairly strong jobs and jobs numbers and around housing and asset prices. I think in general, the consumer feels pretty good around that. And I think as we go into the holiday season, I think we're starting to see some, some early signs of that. I think the other side of it, though, is that as we travel the U.S., as you travel the world, I would say that that same uh, confidence... Uh, or um, conviction is not there in the C-suite in our companies. And whether that's medium, in our case, medium-sized enterprises, big global multinationals, and from a business perspective, not dissimilar from, from banks, that we all appreciate and want as much certainty as we can get. Yep. And I think while we've had very accommodative central bank policies in the U.S. and around the world, got a lot of unanswered questions. China, Brexit, NAFTA, uh, and the list goes on. And in fact, uh, I was telling the story earlier that uh, in my travels, I've begun a little bit of my own survey. And that is, as I go call on companies, I ask them the question. I said, I'm going to give you two scenarios. You have to pick one. And I think it's very telling. I said, in one scenario, you don't get any clarity on China. We kick the can in terms of Brexit. Nothing happens in terms of NAFTA and on and on. But the great news is, uh, well, maybe for them, the great news is we're going to cut rates 75 basis points from here. The other side, we're not going to give you full um, a resolution, but we're going to get at least partially to a China trade deal. We're going to get resolution, whatever it is, in terms of Brexit. We're going to get a USMCA NAFTA done, but for that, rates are going to go up 75 basis points. And right now, at a score, I think last I looked, of 29 to 0, business has unanimously picked, give me a little bit of certainty, and rate doesn't matter. And so I think that's a, an interesting and an important statement around monetary policy today. And in particular, when we start to look at the rest of the world and some of the places that we operate, negative rates don't work. And that monetary policy has run its course and I think we, we need to go at some other things other than monetary policy to try and re-engage business. And, and I'll end here, but I think the risk is, is that either consumers or business are going to be right. And that is that uh, if we get some resolution on some of these issues, I think there's upside to where we are from business momentum. And if I think we don't, some of the business skepticism, pe pessimism, or conservatism ultimately manifests itself in, that in the consumer slowdown. Very good. Kurt, Kurt, let me just get you in on this, given your balance toward the commercial spectrum. You seeing the same thing Mike talked about or doing your own surveys? Yeah, I, I'm going to adopt that survey. I like, I like the, the rate increase that you talked about. Um, so, Comerica, we're 80% uh, commercial banking from a revenue uh, mix standpoint. A lot of that middle market, uh, small business uh, in the U.S. And, you know, back before we kind of hit 2019, we were starting to see a little bit of CapEx spin that really has slowed down. Most of the lending we're doing, uh, most of the businesses we're working with still feel really good about their business overall, but it's a lot of traditional working capital uh, uh, type lending. Our uh, economist has coined the phrase, and maybe it's not original to him, 
high anxiety about high uncertainty. And I think that's really what I hear when I'm out with uh, customers is that they're, they're busy, they feel good about their business overall, but they're a little hesitant on the spending front uh, because of the concerns that uh, were outlined and uh, probably others as well, risk of recession, uh, just the political landscape and election year, et cetera. I vote rates up. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we have a big payments business, and uh, you can see that same phenomenon that both uh, Mike and talked about in that when there is uh, uncertainty in the marketplace, both consumers as well as commercial and business lowers their spend levels a little bit. And when the screen red and or the yield curve flattens, that occurs more. And then when it comes back, it comes back. So that certainty factor is certainly uh, has implications in terms of spend and overall activity in the, in the economy. I, I can see that. But we're not seeing any early indicators on the credit front that would indicate a recession. And we look at it very closely across both the consumer as well as the commercial side of the equation. So no early indicators, but that spend side of the equation is impacted by that confidence factor. Margaret, yeah, I, I would just yeah. say, you know, we do mostly consumer. And the consumer continues to be strong. I think <clears throat> they've actually performed a little better than we thought. Um, and that's something we continue to watch. Um, I think, you know, we're hopeful for a good holiday season, which I think will be a big telling point and, and reinforce how strong the consumer is. And, you know, we're, we're looking to, I think, that holding for, you know, through 2020. I think after that, you know, any, any guess is good. John, anything you'd want to add from your regional view? No, I mean, I would say uh, same is true. Our economies are slowing, but still good. Our business customers are optimistic, but more cautious. A fixed investment and borrowing for fixed investments definitely slowed. Consumers still strong. We're beginning to see a little normalization of credit and some pressure in sectors like manufacturing that have been impacted by tariffs, I think. Energy impacted by some of the volatility of pricing. But overall, the economy is still, still solid, and we're optimistic. So, so it sounds like generally an optimistic view of the macro economy and, and votes certainly among this group of, of uh, increases back on the rate side. <laughs> uh, if we may, let's shift then to, the, and we heard about it a little bit over lunch as well, just the way technology and innovation is shaping the way customers interact with their banks. And Andy, I'll start with you. Clearly you see it as in terms of you know, different channels, multi-channel, omni-channel offerings. What are you doing in terms of serving your, your customers better uh, given the technology innovation? Right. So first, uh, expectations from a customer standpoint aren't, aren't just impacted by how they bank, but how they lead their lives in all industries. So they expect things to be very fast. They expect consistency across channels. So you really need to have a, a, a interactions that are without friction. You need to have systems that talk to each other and you have consistency and speed. So working on all those things through digital applications. I further think that that isn't going to be the answer to the winners. I think that's going to be just foundational or table stakes. So you really need to create unique experiences and value added pro programs and processes and, and products to really engage the customers. And those are the two areas we're focused on. Mike. Sure. Uh, you know, like, like Andy, you know, we, or I, we have a phrase, I have a phrase in that, that, you know, it's not about being best, best in bank. It's about matching, at a minimum, the best in life experiences. And that's the expectations of our customers and clients, not just here, but around the world. And how do we how do, we, we do that? I think the second piece is that we've got to recognize that we're on a journey. I think sometimes financial services gets criticized for potentially moving slow or slower. But we've got to really match off against the journeys that we're on. And you know, the way I think about our bank today is we're really running two banks in many ways. We're running and evolving out of the old analog bank at the same time continuing to build the digital bank. But by the way, for most people in this room, probably certainly for our bank, the, the bulk of our profitability exists in the cohort that actually wants both of those experiences today. They want their branch, they want their person to speak to, but they want their life on their mobile device. And how do we make sure we deliver that? And so we're in this evolution. And to Andy's point, I think we've got to challenge ourselves to be matching that best in life experience. I think that uh, we've seen that certainly come through on servicing customers. I know, Margaret, you've, you've talked about this quite a bit. Yeah, I, I think, you know, the digital front end, I think most of us have all figured out. I think the back end is really what's going to make the difference. 
one, there's just a lot of potential still to get cost out. <clears throat> so I think we have that opportunity. But I think the piece that's going to be really, you know, I always like to do this, you know, how many people like to call an 800 number? <laughs> Usually nobody raises their hand. You know, you're going to have to really be able to uh, chat with that customer. Then when they do have an issue, and I think this is a really important, sometimes gets missed in all this digital talk. People want to talk to somebody when they have a problem. And then what I would say is as we think about transforming our back office, we have to raise the skills of our employees in the back office because the easy things are going to get done through you know, a chat or a text or whatever. But when I have that problem or I have a fraud or I have a concern, that person on the back end has to be able to really make that a great process. And they don't want to be passed around. So many of us have the fraud department, the collection, or the customer service department. We have to kind of rethink our back office and serve that customer in one call. And that takes work, um, both systemic as well as training and developing of the employees in the back, back office. There are any customer segments you see this evolution from this analog to the digital bank going faster or, or slower? Well, I'll tell you, we see through our chatbot, Sydney, that when we introduce it, and you know, it's one of these things that learns, it's a very <coughs> fascinating process to watch, customers really take to it very quickly. They, they don't really want, particularly millennials, they really don't want to talk to anybody, and we all know that because we're parents, <laughs> um, <clears throat> most of us anyway. And they like us, you know, you can call them on the phone, they don't answer, but when you text them, they answer you back. It's actually infuriating. So we see, we see that process working, um, and, but, I, but I will tell you, when you get to that rub where they need someone, they want to have access to someone quickly. And, and I think what, one of the things that we see that's happening there is our companies or our customers that are digital natives, where those relationships are born digitally, they tend to live digitally. Yeah. Right? And so you can see the expectation as they come in, typically, in terms of either what they do or how they enter the bank is typically very telling. Is there a, a kind of, what, what inning do you see where we're in here in kind of this analog to digital transformation? Are we early innings, mid-stage? You know, for uh, consumers, 70% of activity at a bank now happens on a digital device. Uh, for businesses, it's about 50-50. So businesses are a little bit behind, but that's understandable because there's a whole set of processes and uh, you know, long established activities occurring in the business that need to change. So when real-time payments comes, it is here, but when the usage becomes more uh, common, I think that'll be a big game changer. But you know, the interesting part of that is, uh, while it's gonna be better and faster and more secure and provide data and has all kinds of positives, at time zero, there's an investment required. Mike talked about the planning process, and I'm gonna guess uh, reestablishing re your payables and receivables is not high in your priority list, right? So you have to think about how you can help them adjust and change so they can use these new systems. I think on the, uh, you know, it's interesting, we always think about our customers on the sort of retail, wealth management business, you know, those digital uh, venues that we have really are helping us acquire new households. And then with commercial clients, usually it's the relationship, it's the advice, you know, every transaction is fairly customized, you're doing a commercial loan or helping a client with a transaction, et cetera. So you usually don't gain a client through a digital mean, but you can lose a customer if you don't have the digital capabilities and CFOs and treasurers really want the same experience that they're getting in their consumer relationship and their commercial relationship. So treasury management, wire transfer, ACH, all those things have to be able to be delivered you know, via a, a mobile device in a way that is fairly seamless. Uh, and again, I think you're not necessarily going to acquire a commercial client uh, via uh, your digital capabilities, but you certainly can lose them if you don't have the right sort of service level and can't deliver uh, sort of when and how and where they want it. Yeah, I would just add um, over 60% of our customers now use multiple channels, and much as what's been discussed here. And I think they're expecting the same great experience, whether they call the call center, walk into a branch, use their mobile online banking, or go, go to an ATM. And yet our business, I think fundamentally, is still a people business. It's built around bankers, enabled with really good technology, who are presenting unique ideas and solutions to customers. I think it is the combination of both the investment we make in digital and the investment we make in talent that is going to continue to make the difference for us, at least for some period of time. Very good. Let's, let's switch to the fintech topic, which we've heard a lot about the last, uh, last day or so. 
Um, obviously, many of you have partnered with fintechs. John, maybe start with you on any lessons learned partnering with fintechs or, or uh, yeah. lessons to be avoided. Yeah, I guess we uh, probably made our first investment or, or arranged a partnership with fin financial technology companies back in 2012. The idea was we could offer products and capabilities more quickly and at less cost than we could if we tried to do it ourselves. It also was an opportunity, we thought, to, to learn. And, and while most of our partnerships and investments have been around uh, consumer lending, they have, the, our results I would say have been mixed. We've also made some investments in partnerships uh, around small business capabilities. But in every case, we've learned uh, something about customers' desires for, for speed or for a frictionless experience. We've learned a bit about how those financial technology companies think about their business. It's challenged us significantly to, to be better, to be more agile, to be faster, to develop more frictionless and seamless experiences. And so uh, I think just that the, the whole sense of urgency about investing in digital and changing our processes to meet customer needs has been a huge benefit um, from, from the experience that we've had. Andy, how about you? So we also uh, are partnering with a number of fintechs and you know, typically we, we, you know, a banker has the full relationship. We have a balance sheet, deposits, lending. We have the entire financial services and fintech has some thin slice that they do better and faster and more capable. And it's typically an unregulated slice to us, right? I, and, we've, and the partnership I think is working very well. The one lesson learned for sure is scalability. You need to make sure what works for 100 works for a million. Obviously, you've been in the news quite a bit recently with tech partners. So, uh, you know, the conver it's interesting how the conversations have evolved over the last five, six, seven years. You know, I remember going out a while ago, and again, I'm never dismissive around fintech, um, and sitting across the table from a young Silicon Valley entrepreneur and paraphrasing, he looked at me and he pretty much said, coming to eat your lunch, old man. <laughs> <laughs> And I look back and I said, well, uh, again, uh, that's fine. Anytime you care to be highly regulated and trade at a 10 times multiple, we'd love to have you join us. <laughs> and I think, you know, really what we've seen is in some ways a, a coexistence that, you know, for us, um, we are developing many of our own things. We're partnering, we're buying. Um, some of the fintechs are um, terrific partners on our platforms and the things that we offer. Uh, some of the fintechs are terrific clients of the firm in terms of the, si the services that we provide to them. Again, very conscious around um, not being the dumb utility, being very conscious around, uh, around not giving away uh, unconsciously the client or customer ownership that's there. But I, I think there's a, a reasonable ecosystem right now, and, and I think in general the industry is kind of challenging each other, and it's making us all better at what we do. Kurt or Margaret, anything you'd want? Yeah, I, I would say we've done a lot with fintech, and I'd say two two important things. One, I think you have to be careful of running after shiny objects. I think the organization sometimes can get lost in, wow, that looks really cool, but then no one really wants it. So you've got to be careful that you're not wasting the organization's time. I think it's really important to have business people engaged on how this technology is going to help them grow and really help their businesses. And when you have that connection, uh, it's, a, it's usually a big win. So, you know, we've invested in, in companies that have really changed the game for us in some places. And I feel it really works when you have, you know, the owner of the P&L who's really driving that change to really be engaged in making sure that that's a, a successful uh, integration or a buy-in, however we're doing it. Because I do think, you know, we've, not every one we've done has been successful. Most have. But I think we learned. I think we learned a lot as we've gone through this process of what works and what doesn't work. Yeah, I might just add uh, to the, what's been said thus far. So we've been uh, a little careful uh, on the fintech uh, front. Uh, we certainly have a number of uh, players that we are in partnership with, less from an investment standpoint and more of a capabilities um, scenario. And we have been leveraging, uh, we're in the technology, early stage technology lending business. And so we've been leveraging uh, many of those relationships to help us sort of think um, more outside the box about opportunities. I'd also say that uh, for us, uh, part of the journey has been really 
focusing less on our legacy platforms and more migration of, of a lot of our applications to the cloud, and then really partnering with a couple of key third-party vendors, which is allowing us to move quicker uh, to market and uh, probably less proprietary uh, customization of capabilities and more riding along with a couple of key vendor relationships that we have a lot of confidence in. It's really helping us from a, a speed to market uh, capability. Is there any area of, of the whole banking ecosystem where you say this is where fintechs can really make a difference? Obviously, we've seen them much more in the lending space than around the deposit side balance sheet, maybe a little bit in wealth management as well. But where do you see them, maybe the nature of what fintechs do helping the banking system more or less, or do you see them getting more into deposits? I think where we've seen the, the greatest benefit is in the customer front end. So not in the deposit taking, nor the lending, nor the underwriting of the balance sheet, but at the front end where they may have a capability that fits into the rest of the bank and just is able, they are able to adjust and develop more quickly and more rapidly. Is your question, how have we used that or how do we see them positioning and where are their entry points? The second one, where, where do you see them positioning more for the future? Because I think to date, most of the ones we've seen certainly are front end lending. Yeah, well, I think that you know, from what we've seen, the, the playbook uh, fairly standard, right? They come in, they don't choose or opt to do everything. They pick a particular channel or function, they disaggregate, they go at it and then build from there. And uh, you know, we've seen, I think, a number of people come into the payment space. And you say, why payments? Well, um, consumer payments in particular, you can come in, you don't have to be regulated. It's not capital intensive, per se. Uh, you, get, you actually get paid for doing it, right? right. You get swipe fees yes. around it, and you get customer data, which you can then use to decide how you're going to expand those boundaries. At some point, they get to the, the boundary that forces them to contemplate the, 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 the regulation, right? and that's probably right. typically most around deposit taking, but we've seen in, from, from some of the lending platforms that the deposit taking at some point becomes, a, I don't, while it's maybe not a necessity, it's a, pretty much a, a need to have. And then they've got to make that decision around the platform whether that makes sense or not. And I agree. I think, I think payments is the area that has both the thinnest mode and the most capabilities and the most potential um, value in terms of data and information that they could utilize. So that's the area that's probably the most exposed. I think the other area is, 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 is data and fraud tools. That's another hot area now, helping folks figure out how to stop fraud. Well, let, let's jump then to the payments arena, uh, given, that, given that nice transition. Uh, obviously, a lot going on in terms of you know, real-time payments, I innovation payments. A uh, little bit of uh, how do you think uh, about positioning your institution best in that rapidly changing ecosystem? And what do you think you need to you know, develop most quickly, own or partner with to, to provide provide clients as, as these changes happen. Andy, uh, maybe start with you. You know, I, I think the, the game changer that's occurring right now is the uh, RTP, real-time payments, which is going to change what's been, you know, frankly, decades of checks, ACH wires. It's going to change the way business pays business. It's going to change invoicing and bill pay. It's going to change a lot of things. And as I said, there's a time zero investment required to get that done. So what we're very focused on is working with our clients to help them solve problems, to help them add value to their process because they have to invest something in order to get something. And we want to work together with them to make it work for them. Because I think the long term is going to be very beneficial. It's going to be a little bumpy in the short term. The more we can work with them to see the value, the better. John? Uh, I would agree with Andy. Uh, you know, there's certain customer behaviors that have been established based upon the way we process payments today. And I think as we evolve to a real-time world, uh, customer habits will have to change. It's an opportunity for us to provide financial education and have good conversations with the customers about you know, how they manage their funds from day to day. And uh, it'd be, a, I think, an opportunity for us. And Kurt, are you seeing this as much in the commercial arena in terms of clients demanding close to real-time payments and, and you know, multi-access, yeah. multi? No, I, I clearly think so. And I think it, you know, we, we will all wake up a couple years from now and it will be the norm. And so that transformation will have occurred and, and, you know, getting on the sort of the pathway as institutions, whether you're a large institution or a regional bank uh, like ourselves. And again, I, I think Andy said it well, it is a change in, 
and how we've prosecuted the business for a really, really long, a really, really long time. And I think maybe real-time payments will be even more impactful in commercial segment than in the consumer segment, just given the dollar volume and the, the high frequency of, of transactions that need to occur intraday and um, cross-country, et cetera. You've obviously seen a lot of this cross-border and, uh, and given the international footprint. What do you, what do you see kind of coming fr from international to influence the way this evolves in the U.S.? Well, uh, you know, as we look around the world, there's, you know, many, many countries that have moved to real-time payment. We are absolutely behind. Right. And I would say, you know, one of the experiences while, you know, if we pulled the room, everybody loves the concept of real-time payments we would probably get slightly, a slightly less favorable result around the reality of the real-time debit. <laughs> right? on, on the other side of every real-time payment is a real-time debit. And the question is, are operating accounts prepared to do that? When I hit that button, it is gone. Got no ability or very limited ability to get it back, and it's going out of my account. So do I have enough information coming at me real-time in my operating account to give me confidence to operate in that way? I think that's going to in some cases, um, force some positive change as part of that. I think second, and it's been touched on, is this concept of identity, cyber, and those pieces, right? Around identity, again, today, you know, we've had the ability where there's been certain types of attacks or fraud, we've had the ability in many instances, because of the slowness of the system, to actually go get those monies back. Right? In the future, real time, when that goes, it's going to go from bank to bank to bank at a pace that's unrecoverable. And so I think it's going to force kind of, uh, across all constituencies uh, probably even a greater focus on making sure people who say who they are and that we're comfortable with where these monies are going. And I think that's a strength, a strength to the system. Mary, you mentioned the fraud piece earlier. How, how, what are you seeing on this kind of the evolution of no, I, identity and fraud, I think as Mike, Mike described Mike it? What Mike said is true. I think, you know, just think of a credit card business and you're getting all these payments and, you know, even purchases and the way that whole process works. You know, you, you have real, you have to have real concern over your stability of identifying that person when they come in and making those payments and understanding how that transaction flows. But, you know, I think. Look, the world of cyber and fraud just continues to be a very challenging area for anyone who's, who's in this business. Even processes we've all put in place, they're already getting broken down. Right. <laughs> so, you know, you're, you're like just as good as you are today, but tomorrow you've got to be better. And I think as we evolve to this real-time payment, I think we're just going to have to continue to really invest in a lot of technology and data to really look at what's happening out there. How do you think about the uh, shift between what you keep in-house in each of your banks versus third parties in this payments ecosystem? Obviously, a lot of third parties that are in, in data, privacy, fraud, identity. How do, you, how do you think about that balance? No, I think it's an important thing. I think a lot of us are highly regulated, so our, our <laughs> regulators are looking at a lot of our third-party vendors and how we're using things. And you know, many of the bigger issues you see is usually they've got in through a third-party vendor. Um, so I, I think this is something that, as you're thinking about, do you build versus buy, do you leverage? Um, and even some of these um, aggregators that our consumers want to use, they're not always, consumers don't always know what they're doing in terms of what they're giving that information to be used for. And a lot of them are not very safe. Um, and then you're battling the consumer says, I really want to do it this way. And we're like, no, we're not you know, partnering with them. And, so we're still in a world of how do we figure that world out because consumers are asking for something that in our, in our minds might not be the safest thing. Um, so I think there's still a lot that has to be worked out as we think about third parties. I think the mantra for all of us has to be that you know, whether, the, whether it's a capability we own uh, or it's a vendor that we're working with, either a FinTech or just a third party technology firm, that cyber oversight and accountability extends through both channels. And so as you're forming those partnerships, you know, you have to measure twice and cut once. I mean, you've got to be very careful about uh, what does the oversight look like, especially for data and information that's flowing outside of your in institution. And, uh, and even the example I gave earlier in terms of, of cloud uh, utilization is a you know, perfect example of that, where you've got to be really careful and really make sure that uh, you're viewing the 
the totality of information and, and customer data, uh, whether it sits again inside your organization or is residing, uh, you know, outside of your of your company. John, I, given where you are in payments, do you see it differently or aligned in terms of that that evolution? Yeah, no, I, I would agree with the comments made. I don't particularly have anything new to add. Great. Let's. Uh, on the, on the cyber point, obviously, it's, it seems every every week there's even more focus on cyber, even more uh, potential risk. You know, where where do you put cyber on your relative list of risks to to worry about, and what what are you kind of doing given given the uh, increasing uh, nature of the risk? Mike, maybe I'll start start with you. I think for everybody on a on a list of one to ten, it's probably one through five, right? It's, yeah. It's right at the top, and it's the thing that is probably evolving the fastest. And uh, it truly is an arms race. I do believe that you know within our industry, and, and uh, the clearinghouse and example is very focused on it, but how do we create the right utilities, right, where we can share this information? It's kind of the one area today where there is uh, government willingness to allow us to share information around this and I think we absolutely have to take advantage of it because uh, it, it makes no sense for any of us to simply be the best at cyber because when the system is attacked everyone is a loser and I think we've got to have that mentality as an industry of coming together and sharing best practices and trying to push as hard as we can to create these utilities. Does anyone see that that risk, assuming you, know, you agree with Mike, Mike on that premise, uh, slowing down, call it the evolution to cloud and, and you know, uh, Margaret, you were describing different partners, and slowing down kind of the partnerships and cloud migration to, to just say we got to get our arms around this first? I don't know if you slow down. I think you have to have the processes and the talent. I think the other challenge I'm sure we all think about every day is the talent around cyber ensuring you're building the talent internally, you have development programs for people within cyber, um, because I think you wanna get the best of the best who are inside your company helping you. Um, but I think you can't just slow down the future of where it's going, knowing that, I mean, cyber's there. You need to make sure you have the right processes and people in place to really um, afford you the opportunity to move forward as technology moves. Now, with that said, I think you have to you can't just be willy-nilly about rolling things out and putting it on a public cloud and things like that. And we've been very cautious in that area of private versus public. And it's something that I think we'll continue to really watch. But, you know, I think, look, cyber's the new war. Right. It's a new war. And we all have to be extraordinarily thoughtful as we talk about cyber, invest in cyber, invest in talent, and to Mike's point, there's no doubt that, that as institutions, we all have to share what we're seeing, what we're hearing. And I do think that process is moving forward and we're gonna be in a better shape. But you know, it's not just about us and cyber. Right. There's a lot of other people out there that we depend on. <clears throat> so cyber's a very big topic. John, let me come to you on kind of this broad topic of technology. Obviously, we've touched on it in payment, cyber, Mike described kind of the analog and digital bank. How are you attracting technology talent how are you building that culture and, and yeah. changing kind of the employee base within that? Yeah, that's a great, great question. Uh, we're, we're establishing deep relationships with, with public, public and private universities in the area, in our markets. We're associating with innovation hubs. We're creating innovation hubs. We're allowing talent to work in different markets. So we're headquartered in Birmingham, but if you want to work in Atlanta or Charlotte or Nashville, we're willing to let you work there. If you want to work from home in some instances, we're certainly allowing talent to work there. Most importantly though, I think what we're trying to do is create a compelling story. So we're reorganizing jobs and functions so that the jobs are more meaningful. We're undertaking a, a whole transformation of our information technology and operations functions. And so how do you tell that story in a way that is compelling and that reinforces the fact that banks are in fact heavily involved in technology and so technologists want to come to work with the banking industry because it is exciting. It's, it's new, it's innovative. There are interesting things going on. And we've had some success because we've been able, been able to do that. And I think uh, that's what we'll continue to focus on as we try to recruit talent. Thank you. Kurt, how about you? 
Uh, similar to, to John, we have been building partnerships with key universities. A lot of our tech organization is headquartered out of our legacy Detroit operation, and uh, there are a lot of uh, other companies headquartered in the area, a lot of the auto manufacturing, and so we've been able to leverage off of, of talent between those organizations. I would say that for a long time, uh, our bank, and I imagine a lot of banks, sort of thought of technology sort of over here on a shelf. And the businesses operated and they kind of occasionally said, we need this from technology. And so we really are thinking about technology as really joint ownership. And so every project, every initiative we have has two owners. It has a business line owner and it has a technology owner. And the accountability for the success of that project really lies between both of those individuals. And if there's not going to be a business sponsor, then we really question whether we need to go down the, the path or not. I think the idea of really incubation and really trying to think uh, um, outside the box. And so one of the things that the team does for me once a month is we have a technology show and tell, which is they just present new ideas, new concepts. Some of them are things we've done. Some of them are not fully baked yet. But just really to get us thinking of, uh, sort of outside the box about what are the sort of the art of the possibility. And the last thing I would say is that most companies think about progression in terms of going from an individual contributor to a leader role, et cetera. And we've worked to develop uh, really career tracks uh, for technologists uh, within the organization and uh, really a promotion of their career without having to go into a leadership role. In some cases, the greatest value they bring is the intellectual capital and the knowledge they've got and the creativity that, that, that they have. And that seems to allow us to attract uh, some talent that we might have, maybe not otherwise could have attracted. You know, Fritz, I just spoke to uh, 300 data scientists at our bank that weren't here a year ago. And I asked them this question because they were from some large tech firms in Silicon Valley. I said, why did you come to U.S. Bank? Or why did you come to Minneapolis? So, and, uh, and it was because... Go Twins. Go Twins, right. Yeah. Um, it was because uh, it's actually... All the disruption that we're talking about is exciting to these people. They're seeing a whole new financial services occurring. You're seeing some of the big tech, uh, tech right. firms getting into financial services. So to be part of that creation and change the way financial activity works is actually kind of cool right now. Margaret. I think for us, we've done a couple of things. You know, we have four innovation stations that are really focused on a couple of key areas on development. We've moved to agile, so we have a, a, a lot of agile teams which are cross-functional. We've actually moved big technology leaders into business operations where they're actually owning a process, which has really been a big win because they just think differently, see differently, and accelerate change. And then we have uh, a business leadership program where we've been very successful in bringing in young talent. And we have three programs we're working with, with universities, two in uh, UConn, one in Stanford UConn, where we just opened up a digital lab. We actually created a cyber program up at UConn stores. We, we actually are creating the curriculum with stores on the cyber program that they're developing. So we paid for a chair and two postdocs. We have a lab up there with students working on our projects. Um, and then we have something out in Illinois where we're working on big data. And we've been able to honestly attract the talent. We're, we're, we're I think, not only attracting, we're attracting and keeping them. And I, for technology people today, it's really about giving them real work and good work and them owning it, and they love that. And so the more you can free up <clears throat> that thinking and get things done, they'll stay because they like working on real things that they really can touch and feel and see getting implemented inside a company. Thank you. Mike, how about you? I think as an industry, we've got a great story to tell young people. And that is while banking is a thousand years old or whatever it is, we are in the very early stages of the next significant chapter of banking. And you've got a chance to be in on the ground. And unlike other times in the past where technologists went back into some back room and uh, you know, maybe they got some things to work together, they're really helping us reshape what banking is today. And I think that's exciting. And around the things they see out there and this movement towards best in life. And by the way, I think a great, a great selling tool that we all have is we're really well funded as well. <laughs> right? Right. We're, we're committed to this. This is our livelihood. And we're going to really see this through. And we really need your help. And there's great career paths around it. And um, uh, I think it's a really exciting time. There's a lot to be said for making payroll, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, we've got a number of questions that have already come in. Please add others. We're going to uh, go and ask each, each of the panelists here, each CEO, kind of what they see as the biggest 
opportunity and risk for 2020 as we've kind of talked about the macro economy, changes in consumers, evolving technology, uh, and, and how that integrates into the bank. So, John, we'll maybe start with you and come on down, and then we'll okay. come to the questions all of you have, have sent in. Uh, for opportunities, I'm most excited about the convergence of process improvement, AI, and data. Uh, we're going to make investments in replacing our core loan deposit systems over the next few years. We believe we can do that within the context of our current technology budgets and how we think about process improvement, which then we use to drive the development of our core systems to both improve the customer experience and importantly transform the operations function to make us more efficient and effective, as we talked about earlier today, I think has tremendous power and is something that we're very excited about. In terms of challenges, in a slow growth environment, um, some will stretch to grow, and I think for us, it, our challenge will be to, to remain disciplined to focus on the things that, that we can control. Remember, it's a long game, and, um, and so client selectivity, sound underwriting, actual credit servicing, all really important to us as we think about uh, how we get through 2020 and into 2021. Yeah, I would maybe piggyback on some of what uh, John said around just the, um, the economy and the, the customers that we're working with. I actually feel a lot better about the economy than maybe some of the economists and others would uh, purport. And so, you know, we're looking at our business customers, our consumer uh, customers as well. I actually think the economy will perform better in 2020 than maybe some folks are giving it credit for. And so I think there will still be nice uh, opportunities on the lending side. We are being a little bit more cautious there, um, uh, kind of late, late in the cycle. I think the consumer is still relatively healthy, and so I think that will translate into probably more opportunities than not in 2020, and maybe we can forestall an, an actual recession. And then secondly, uh, we've got a fair number of technology initiatives that are either customer or colleague enabling that really are all kind of coming to fruition for us in 2020 a new sort of company-wide CRM platform. We've done a lot of enhancements to our banking center platform, a new uh, onboarding platform for our, our retail customers, a lot of investment in treasury management capabilities, a new payments platform, coupled with some of the things that are more industry-driven like real-time payments that'll be coming down the pike. So I'd say for us, it's, it's two things. One, I think there's still an opportunity for us to grow, just given the strength of where the consumer is right now. And how do we continue to leverage that opportunity to ensure that, you know, for us, one of the things we're working a lot on is personalized marketing. How do we really get right to what that customer is really looking for? How do we support, because support, we go through third parties, mostly retailers, how do we support them as they're going through their transformation? So technology for us is key on the front end. On the back end, it's really a little bit of what everyone said, is how do we get cost out of the back room? How do we get cost leverage? Because I think that's going to be a really important point as we go into whenever you know, the recession does happen, because it will happen someday, um, we want to all be ready for that. And I think getting ahead of that curve, the quicker you can, the better you're going to be positioned as you go into uh, a long-term, a, lo a longer-term you know, challenge in the economy. So you know, we're feeling pretty, pretty good about where we're positioned today. Great. Risks, cybersecurity, uh, economic uncertainty, and uh, disruption, the competitive threat, opportunity disruption, and what we can do with that digital evolution, both for our customers and also in our back room. We're spending a lot of time on that. Mike? I think most have been mentioned. I'll go back to where we started, and that's uncertainty. Uh, and I think there's upside given where expectations are. And if we can get a few things solved or get some more clarity on things, I think expectations are low enough that I think you could see a significant improvement uh, in terms of things. And again, remember in this cycle that you know, the way I think about it, it's right now the, the consumer, too, and the market's nothing. And what I mean by that is when we go back to the end of 2015, oil $28 a barrel, U.S. recession, China hard landing, six, seven months later, new market highs. The fourth quarter last year, we were sitting here a year ago, it was pretty dark days. The market was down every day. By the way, we came out of that, market's back to new highs. So if we could actually get some of this uncertainty solved, I think it would go a long way, and I'll put the risk the other way. If we have continued or mounting uncertainties, I think it drags us down faster. Great, thank you. Well, we, we have a whole bunch of questions and, and a few minutes left. So let me start with one someone posed on uh, kind of 
thoughts around data aggregator practices regarding data and, and customer consent, especially with regard to you know, fintech fraud, et cetera. Mark, maybe start with you. How do you think about data practices? And also, uh, let me add to this question, the whole, how's the regulatory framework evolving here on, on this data issue? Well, one, I think you know all of us have to be prepared for the regulation that's happening, and we're, we're well on the path to comply with what California has set as a standard. Um, and I think uh, they continue to evolve what that standard looks like, by the way. Um, <laughs> so we're, we're hard at work to ensure that we can fulfill that from a customer perspective. Look, I'm a believer that we have to be able to, if a customer doesn't want their data shared, we, we shouldn't be sharing it. And you know, we've all been in businesses where we've had strong privacy rules and regulation, and we've all had to comply with that. I put this in a similar uh, level. I do think, though, that, that we have to get a better handle on what is really happening outside the industry and where there is things that are occurring that may not be in the best interest of the customer. Um, and you know, that's where I think, one, we, we can play a role in that as we continue to talk to our regulators about what we're seeing so that there's transparency in that. Um, but I think that's an area that's going to continue to evolve. Um, and I think at some point, you know, someone's going to say, OK, we've got to all control where the data is going and who owns it and where is it sitting. And, you know, the reality is the consumer sh should own their data, right? Uh, unless it's related to a credit decision where we right. need to have those, the access to those types of things. So I think this is going to be a fast evolving discussion. And I think as we comply with California, that'll be the first, you know, level. <laughs> Hopefully it's that level. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Any, any other views on this, especially on this regular piece? Because I was curious how that might evolve on the regulatory front, be it California or other national or federated uh, piece. I, I think it has the ability to be a nightmare. Yeah. Um, you know, we got California uh, going fine. By, by the way, complete believer. Client data, customer right. data is their data. Um, it's, it's theirs to dictate the usage of, uh, and it should be protected. Right. And so I think very clear on that. But, you know, as a firm that operates in Europe under GDPR and various privacy regimes around the world, to end up in the United States with 50 individual yeah. schemes is, is a nightmare. The California Attorney General came out with their own study that put the cost of compliance with California's data privacy at $55 billion for the, for the private sector to implement. Take that across the country, and I think what, what people, in, in, from my view, are failing, or, or what authorities are failing to do today, is to take the view from the client experience. Right? What does it mean? Right. And all of a sudden, it's going to be so complicated. When we think about how many times do you go on and you got to click that cookies box and you say, do I really need this or not, because I'm about to give it all away. Are you going to opt in or opt out into this? It's going to be so complicated in terms of its application, I think it's going to lose its efficacy uh, and its meaning as part of that. And I think as an industry, we need to be pushing very hard at the state level not to get into this continual gold plating as we go across the country and to push our local politicians and legislatures as much as we can for harmonization. And I think, you know, and if you look at Europe as a little bit of the case study, uh, they've done it in 26 countries took a little bit of give and take. They've actually brought some others. They brought Switzerland in. They brought some others in with them. And they've all kind of kept to the, to the, same, the same overlay. And I, I think we're going to start in a different place. Hopefully, we can work our way there. Very good. Let me, uh, the questions are coming in hot and heavy right now. So Andy, maybe to you. Uh, Every time there's a story about another major hacking incident, it makes me wonder whether we've properly considered the costs of the paradigm shift into digital banking. How do you stay a step ahead of all that? You know, uh, it gets a little bit to what we were talking about. I think we, uh, as an industry, are so focused on building thicker walls and higher walls with the data that we have in the house, and we sometimes forget about all the doors that we created to send data out of the house. Either the cus customer's asking for the data or we're sending it someplace. So I think we need to focus as much on the data ins and outs as the walls. I think the value of all this is there. I just think we need to shift our focus a little bit. And we're, you know, that's something we talk a lot about because a lot of the hacks that have occurred haven't necessarily been within the four walls of the right. institution. Yeah, very good. Um, Kurt, maybe over to you, a uh, question on, on you know, will this evolve toward a handful of central 
bank digital currencies around the globe in, in five years? And, and you know, can, can it just go all the way there, given the technology and Bitcoin and so on? Do you see that happening at all, or is that a f far out beyond the time frame we're, we're uh, focused on? I think you have to remember that you know, a lot of our um, the United States, for example, is served by community and small banks. And so uh, you may end up with sort of a stratosphere of what might work in, for larger institutions, commercial customers, et cetera, uh, versus what works for you know, the person that owns the local you know, grocery store. Uh, I personally think that the transformation to digital currency is a longer journey um, than, uh, than, than probably the next several years. And I still think there's a lot of uh, cyber concerns, a lot of regulatory concerns to work uh, through, uh, a lot of potential loss issues to get our hands around before, before we get there. Great. Question, and, and Margaret, I'll start with you, although Andy and Mike may have views as well. Uh, with all the interest in point of sale lending from, from you know, non-banks and obviously being involved in co-brand and private level label cards, how, how do you see that evolving either from a, are they complementary or are they, uh, let's say, com competitor products for, uh, or, or just consumers use all of them? So, I, you know, look, I think there's been some interesting technology advances that some of the firms have made. Um, I, you know, I'm, I've been around in the consumer credit business for a long time. Um, I'm actually personally as a not a big fan of buying, you know, sneakers and four payments. Um, <laughs> so I, you know, I think it'll be interesting to see how these companies evolve as we go through a tougher cycle. Um, but with that said, um, look, I think the retail market in particular, they're looking for any way to actually sell and keep the customer. So that in some ways puts us in a position where we just have to be better. Mm. And we have to be make sure we're keeping the technology, driving it forward, um, and, and ensuring that that seamless, frictionless experience for the customer is happening at any point, whether it's at the point of sale in the store or sitting on your, your couch at home. So, you know, I view these things as it's always good to have a good set of competitors because it raises your bar on what you have to do. Um, I think the comfort I have is that we have people who answer the phones in the back end, and <laughs> we have a strong balance sheet, and we're going to be there for the long term. And I think some of this will shake out. I don't think all of it will shake out, but some of it will shake out, in my opinion. Andy or Mike, anything you'd want to add, add to that? You know, I actually, um, if you think about the way people fund things historically, home equity loans and credit cards, I think there's going to be an evolution to a different form. And I, and I happen to believe it will occur. So I think we're thinking about how we play in that game as opposed to saying, let's hold it off. Yeah, we, we've already combined our, our traditional cards business with our personal lending, right, just into a lending unit. And I think we're moving much more towards real time, bespoke underwriting, credit scoring, rate applying, terms applying, um, some as part of normal course of business, some as part of one-off transactions. But I think as an industry, that's, that's absolutely where we're headed. Very good. Question here on uh, kind of the increasing cost of compliance and, and to what extent do you think that regulatory technology, so technology focused at compliance, audit, et cetera, is, is uh, a way you'll, you'll you know, become more efficient in that realm? Uh, John, yeah, start, start with you. I think we will. I mean, back to my comment earlier about the convergence of process improvement, data, artificial intelligence, there are a number of processes that are inherently uh, you'd say targets for that as an opportunity to, to improve, and, and I'd say BSA AML compliance would be an example of where we ought to be able to use artificial intelligence and data and the combination of those things through improved processes to drive, drive costs down. Any, anyone else either using RegTech today or see it? Uh, I wouldn't call it RegTech, but our audit team is definitely using more decision science to really do the audits, which has really helped. I think us go deeper into our operations to really look at areas, and that's been a real advantage, I think, as instead of looking at a subset, you can look at the whole data set, and that's been a positive. I think AML BSA is a big opportunity. Uh, what is done with eyeballs today, if that could be done by machines, could tr offer tremendous uh, cost advantages. Absolutely. Uh, there's a specific question I'm interested in here. It's, uh, 
uh, about the consumer experience, but with respect to a specific feature, bill pay, and say, you know, we, we banks in general, and I think part of this is due to our privacy requirements, is bill pay may feel maybe a little behind what some some uh, other folks in the market could offer. A any any views on this, or should I move to the next question? <laughs> I, I th so as part of that, I th it, it has been, I think, a more painful experience than we'd ever want it to be for, for different reasons. But I think um, the evolution of tokenization and the information inside that we can put inside those tokens is going to phenomenally push that forward. Very good. There's a, uh, in terms of wealth and, and asset management, which we haven't talked about a lot, uh, do you view kind of the move to, uh, you know, zero fees and wealth as well as passive investing kind of a, a threat to your, your wealth and asset management divisions respectively to the extent you're, you're, you're in those? You know, we're in, in our business. You know, we we certainly have a, a portion of our wealth business that would be aligned more with our traditional banking center branch uh, network, and in that sector, you certainly are seeing a movement more towards passive investment, robo advisors, et cetera. But in the sort of core wealth management business, the folks you think of as more high net worth, so much of that is still driven around advice. And really what the customer is paying for is the advisory services, maybe trust services, other things that we're bringing alongside of it. So it's definitely an evolution, but there might, uh, I believe there's a way for both to coexist. I think it offers an opportunity, actually, if we think about the digital and the lower cost to democratize products that were typically only available for the affluent to a more broad-based population. So I think it's a, it's a good thing. Mike, a question for you on the, the deposit program with Google. If... Uh, if you can give some color on that, maybe how you're thinking about it, uh, or you know, do you view it as, as a, a co-brand deposit? I'm just, just reading Sure, that. Sure. So there, there's more to come, and uh, Google and ourselves will be coming out uh, probably uh, fairly early in the, in the new year to talk about it. I think on the surface, really what it is is it's a, um, um, an interface between the Google search and the Google, uh, the Google app and having an embedded bank having pay. So if you think about today, you go on, and in my analogy, you go on, you search for a garden hose, you ultimately leave, you go to a site and you buy that. Google gets the search, they don't necessarily capture the end transaction as part of that. What this is, is you will have a bank account, um, hopefully it's a city account, uh, <laughs> in there, um, and that will be our customer in there. We will have the data. Google will have access to the transactional data and the search and those things that in many cases they have already today, but there'll be a convenient point where, again, around single click or you know, whatever the mechanism is, you've got the ability to consummate that transaction as part of that. From our perspective, we think it's a, a very efficient way to, uh, to bring new clients into the bank. We've got digital services that kind of provide the engine of this today. So the technology exists that we're putting uh, into this. Uh, and um, uh, we're, you know, we're excited about kind of what it potentially means. And again, it's not just going to be a city or, uh, uh, or others. It'll be, it'll be an open architecture where other banks will be on it as well. Thank you. Oh, just one last question. Any predictions on the Super Bowl winner this season? I hate to say it to Patriots, no. I, I, and as a New Yorker, I really do hate saying that, but. <laughs> Andy? No, I'm not going to produce. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, uh, thank you all. John, Kurt, Margaret, Andy, Mike, thank, thank you. you. Thank Appreciate you. It.